Okay, let's get started today. So we're going to continue talking about algorithms and data structures. And we're going to talk about ways that we analyze algorithms, and we're going to introduce some ideas and some notation and some classifications that we will return to again and again as we talk about algorithms to do things like search and sort and, you know, hash things and do other, other tasks on data. We'll also start talking about some different data structures. We're actually going to start designing a data structure together, and we'll work on that on the homework problems for the next couple of days as well, to illustrate some of the fundamental trade-offs that take place once we start thinking about different ways to store data. So algorithms provide these trade-offs in terms of how we do things. Data structures also provide trade-offs in terms of how we manipulate them. So different data structures have different properties that make one type of operation on them fast and another type of operation on them slower. And as a computer scientist, understanding these trade-offs is a big part of what allows you to write sophisticated computer software, choosing the right tool for the job. Okay, so, so an algorithm is a series of steps for solving a problem or for performing some operation. Some of the things that we're going to show you today don't necessarily seem like they're solving a problem, but they are. The problem might be, how do I add an item to a list of items, for example? Um, so that's kind of an easy problem to talk about. But the way we approach these as computer scientists is we're interested in using computers to solve these problems. One of the fun things we get to talk about a little bit later today in class is some of the fundamental limits surrounding this type of computation. But the way we're going to do this, we're going to, when we look at how to solve algorithms in this class or how to implement algorithms, we're going to be looking at computer code. And that's going to connect us directly with some of the skills and abilities that you guys now have since we're done with the first half of the class. So how do we implement algorithms using a computer? We perform simple calculations. We store results. We'll show some data structures that allow us to do this in different ways. Um, we make simple decisions and we repeat this as fast as possible. So these are the, the same concepts that you guys have been learning and practicing since we started. A data structure is some way that allows us to store information. We've looked at arrays. Arrays are a particular type of data structure. They bring some type of structure to data. An array just doesn't hold values, although it does do that. It also puts them in order. So we've imposed some structure on the underlying data. We'll see different types of structures that we can impose on that data as we go forward. So as Java programmers, we're also going to be implementing data structures together. We're going to do that by using the things that we know about, and particularly some of our object-oriented design principles. So we're going to use primitive types and objects to actually store the data itself. We'll use existing data structures like arrays when appropriate. We'll show today how we can build a more general version of an array that allows us to do some of the things that might have been bothering you about arrays. Why can't I add elements to them after I create it? That's really annoying. So today we're going to start talking about a generalization of an array called a list. And there's several different ways to implement a list. We'll look at two of them over the next couple of days. One of them uses an array internal, so it uses an array to store the data. And then we can also build data structures by taking multiple instances of different Java objects and connecting them together by having one store a reference to another. We'll see this on Friday when we talk about lists implemented using linked lists. We'll also see this next week when we start talking about trees and start talking about recursion. So these are the tools we have in our bag for accomplishing these things, for implementing algorithms and for building new data structures. Okay. And again, these are highly complementary topics. So for the next couple months, we're going to sort of constantly be intermingling these two ideas. So we'll talk a little bit about an algorithm, and then we'll show you a data structure that enables that algorithm. Or we'll talk a little bit about a data structure first, and then we'll discuss some of the properties that that data structure has that enable a certain type of algorithm to function well. Because, you know, really, data structures exist to serve the needs of computer algorithms. There's no reason to implement some of these fancy data structures except for the fact that they allow us to do things faster, certain types of operations. There's also a lot of trade-offs in this space, which is really fun to talk about. So we'll start looking at some of those today. Like I said, different implementations of the same interface, different implementations of Java that both can behave in the exactly same way, 
can have very different performance characteristics because of how they're implemented. This connects us back to interfaces, because the nice thing about interfaces is that you don't have to care how that object is implemented, you just care what it does. But understanding a little bit about how it's implemented and how it's implemented creates trade-offs in terms of how the operations perform is something that's important for you as a computer scientist. Okay, and well, this is a fantastic chance for us to practice these imperative and object-oriented ideas along the way. So I'm always gonna be looking for opportunities for the next couple months to, you know, bring back interfaces, to bring back encapsulation and polymorphism and talk about some of those concepts and, and to do our, bring back some of our imperative programming ideas as well. So this is great practice as we also introduce some of these new ideas. This is super fun. Okay. All right, so last time we talked a little bit about um, a brute force algorithm for implementing the GCD. And I'm just gonna very, very quickly uh, implement this. So you remember what our strategy was. Our strategy was start at the minimum of the two numbers, because the minimum is the largest number that can be the GCD. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna create a new variable called starting point. I'm gonna set that equal to first, and then I'm gonna say if second is less than first, let's say it's starting point is equal to second. And then I have a loop. I start with the largest number. I'm gonna continue while i is greater than one. I'll show you why in a minute. And then I'm going to decrement. So I'm starting at the largest number that could be potentially the greatest common denominator. I'm working my way downwards. Okay? How do I test whether or not the number divides both equally? I use my remainder operator in Java. So I say if the remainder, when I divide the first number by the number I'm testing is zero, and if the remainder, when I divide, oop, I actually have to use the right operator, is zero, then I have found the GCD, otherwise I keep going. If I break out of the loop, what does that mean? It means that I got down to one, essentially. The last number that this loop will test is two, because it stops once i is equal to one, because it's no longer greater than one, I break out and return one. So I know that one is always the GCD for any two numbers. Let's see if, oop. I have a bug in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. No, that's still angry with me. I think I've been writing too much. Try just commenting this out, see if this works. Ah, right, thank you. I did practice this before class, it was embarrassing. All right, good, thank you. The voice from the balcony, helping me out. Right, so this works, good. This is, the, this is the correct result. So you see 50 and 100, the right answer is 50. It's actually the minimum of the two, but it divides both. Uh, 10 and 8, the right answer is 2. Those last two numbers are relatively prime, meaning that they don't have a common factor. All right? So this was our brute force approach for doing this. So let's use this as an example to think about how long this is going to take. And when you're starting off thinking about these types of problems, doing this type of algorithm analysis, I would really encourage you to look at the code. You know, I'm gonna ask, we'll ask on some quiz questions and upcoming, um, you know, assessments, you know, how long would it can take, take how many steps of the algorithm are required to compute something like the GCD of four and six, right? Um, what about 185 and 200, 2045? Well, let's see here. If my inputs are 185 and 2045, how many times is that inner loop going to execute? Potentially. You don't have to worry about what the answer is. Yeah. 185 times. That's my worst case scenario. So when we start talking about alg analyzing algorithms, we're also always concerned with what's the best case scenario for the algorithm, what's the worst case scenario, and then what happens most of the time. So if you don't know the answer to the GCD, Maybe the two numbers have no common factors, in which case that inner loop, that loop is gonna execute 185 times. 
And we can generalize this to be able to say that given any two numbers, m and n, this algorithm, the worst case behavior for the algorithm is that that loop executes the minimum of m and n times. So as m and n get larger and larger and larger, my algorithm gets slower and slower and slower. What we'll start talking about today are different categories of how much slower different algorithms get, because this really makes a huge difference. For reasonably small numbers, this algorithm performs fine. If you start using extremely large numbers and try to compute the GCD, this algorithm starts to perform extremely poorly. And GCD is actually a building block for a lot of crypto uh, cryptographic algorithms that do operate on huge numbers. And nobody would ever implement it this way. It's way too slow. So there are much more sophisticated approaches for, for doing this. That, that as the numbers get larger, they can grow as quickly. So when we analyze algorithms, we're concerning ourselves with the answers to a couple of different questions. So we have a particular strategy that we're gonna use to solve a problem. And we want to know, how well does it perform? When we talk about performance, we can mean a couple of different things. We can talk about how long it's going to take for a computer to run it. And usually we talk about that in sort of an abstract way, like how many operations or how many steps is it going to take. We don't really talk about how many seconds or milliseconds is it going to take. We can measure that. But that varies from computer to computer. If I run it on a supercomputer, it's a little bit faster. If I run it on your phone, it's a little bit slower. But so normally we're talking about steps, operations, right? We're not thinking about exactly how long it takes the computer to run it. Um, we also sometimes want to think about the memory consumption of different algorithms. How much space do they use in the computer's memory? Because again, neither one of these things are finite resources. Or sorry, infinite resources. They're both finite resources. You know, developing a new algorithm that speeds up a particular problem can allow me to use fewer computers, of which there are a finite number. And if my algorithm consumes too much memory, at some point I'm going to run out or it's going to make it more difficult for that computer to do other things, and my algorithm is going to slow down again. So both of these things are resources that the computer has to devote to solving a problem that we want to think about when we al analyze how well algorithms do. The other thing we're going to do when we talk about algorithms is we're going to usually think about what, what we're going to try to determine is how well they perform at the limit, when their inputs get very, very, very big. This is sometimes called asymptotic behavior. So, you know, we don't care as much about how GCD performs with smaller numbers, but we want to kind of understand how its performance grows, uh, particularly once the numbers start to get very large. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that sometimes you need to understand how an algorithm handles really large inputs because it might receive them. The other reason is that there's all sort of like, there, there are these like constant time things that we want to ignore, right? So for example, if we really look hard at our GCD algorithm, we see that it's doing some work up at the top, right? It has to do, and there are some steps in the algorithm here to figure out what the minimum value is. We don't care about those. That's a constant time. That's gonna be constant no matter what the numbers are. Comparing numbers together is a constant time operation, and so I don't really want to consider these little pieces of the algorithm that don't dominate its performance once the inputs get really large. And so by thinking about really large inputs, it allows me to kind of ignore things like setting up, you know, some of the data, you know, that I need to start the algorithm, maybe returning the results or whatever. All that stuff just sort of goes away. Because what happens is as first and second get big, or as the minimum of the two gets really large, that loop from seven to 10 starts to dominate. If you wrote out all of the things the computer had to do to solve the problem, including all of the steps inside the loop, once the minimum of M and N starts to get really large, that stuff up top is just not important anymore. Most of the thing you're gonna write down are gonna be all of those repeated loop steps. So looking at asymptotic behavior allows us to understand sort of the fundamental performance of the algorithm and ignore these sort of constant time things. Jeremy. It's constant because it doesn't vary with the size of the problem. So finding a minimum of two numbers doesn't slow down as the numbers get larger. Good question. All right. And then we also want to talk about, like I said, best, worst, average case behavior. 
there are some algorithms that will terminate very quickly or will finish very quickly when they're given certain inputs. And then there are other inputs where they can take a long time. And particularly once we talk about, you know, sorting algorithms, there are certain sorting algorithms that sometimes we refer to this as pathological behavior. There's a particular, uh, case that causes them to really, really slow down. So if you give them a particular kind of input, they do really well. If you give them a different type of input, they're really, really, really slow. And so avoiding the understanding what those pathological cases are and avoiding them uh, is important. If those pathological cases aren't very common, then we may not be concerned, but sometimes those pathological cases are very common. So they're, they're inputs that the algorithm is going to get uh, frequently. And if those inputs take a lot longer, then its performance is both very variable and could be extremely bad under those cases. Yeah. Yeah, so the average case is, is frequently kind of tricky. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, usually, what, usually we think about things like, um, you know, if, if I'm working with an array of numbers, what does it do if they're just random, right, randomly distributed, right? But it's a great question. What do we mean by my average case? That's a slippery word here. We really don't mean a, um, a mathematical average. We're talking about a common case. In certain algorithms, the common case may not be random inputs, right? So when we start talking about sorting, there's a lot of cases in the real world where the inputs to sorting algorithms are almost sorted. And so the sorting algorithm needs to accommodate that. One of the new modern sorting algorithms that's only been around for a couple of years, one of the things it does really well is it's very fast if the inputs are almost sorted already. And the reason why that's important is because that's a very common case. It's common that I have some data that I got from somewhere that's like almost completely sorted, and I just want to finish the job. There might be not a lot of work to do. Under those cases, this particular algorithm is extremely fast. Okay. And then, you know, again, how is the algorithm's performance related to its input? So one of the things we have to do is we have to identify, there's two steps to this. Step one is identifying the input that's driving performance. Step two is figuring out how the algorithm's performance is related to that input. So when we did GCD, we, we performed both of those steps. The first thing we said is, what's the input that's driving performance? It's the minimum of the two values. And then we said, you know, how does the performance scale with that input? So the mathematical notation we use to describe this is something called big O notation. And this is designed to describe algorithmic performance in a way that's really general. So we're only gonna talk about five or six different classes of algorithmic behavior. The other thing we do with big O notation that you'll see over and over again is a lot of times we will we'll throw away constant factors. So if something scales with the, like if the GCD algorithm scaled with the minimum divided by two, we just say it scales with the minimum. We don't worry about factors like divided by two or, you know, multiplicative or, you know, divisors in this, right? We're just concerned about how it grows, all right? So here are some graphs showing the different complexity classes we're going to talk about. So on the x-axis is essentially the size of the problem. And that, you know, again, it depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about GCD, that's the minimum of the two numbers. If we're talking about sorting, that's the number of values I'm trying to sort. If I'm talking about searching, it might be the number of values that I need to look through. On the y-axis is the time that this takes. And you can see that there's an enormous difference here, right? This is why this problem is so important and so interesting. So all the way on the left there, we have O factorial. So this is a, you know, complexity class where the problem grows as the factorial of its inputs. That line is like a rocket ship taking off, right? It almost looks like it's going straight up. These all start at zero, actually, but that one is just taken, that, that one's going bad, like to a very, very bad place. So if you write an O n factorial algorithm, you are gonna need a lot of computing resources to run that very, very quickly. So again, that's sort of like the worst case here. It's almost O infinity, it's just bad, really bad. Right next to it, we see exponential behavior. So in this case, the problem grows as some number to the exponent of the size. 
So in this case, it's two to the n. This is also really bad. Like you can see, again, you know, I'm, if, if I test with small inputs, I might, you know, uh, trick myself into thinking that the problem is tractable, but once I give it slightly larger instances, you know, I am, things get really slow, really fast. On the other hand, down here, along the x-axis, you see a couple of complexity classes that we really like. One that you can't even see on the graph, because it's literally just sitting there on the x-axis, is constant time, a one. So what does that mean? It means that the algorithm's performance actually doesn't depend on the input. It always takes the same amount of time. That is fantastic. That's like the thing you dream about. It's usually not possible. But if you have an O constant time algorithm, you're good. You're really good. Because you know how long it takes, and even if you give it a really, really big instance of the problem, it still takes that long. All right, so that's a really nice feature. Down here, we also see log n. So now this is growing with the logarithm of the size of the problem. That's a very, very gentle growth rate. Sort of the inverse of two to the n is log n. And again, if we can find a log n algorithm for our problem, then we're in really good shape in general. Then we see O n. So this is sometimes called linear time. So this means as the problem gets bigger, the algorithm slows down proportionally to how much bigger the problem is. The GCD algorithm that we just saw is O n. So as the problem gets bigger, it slows down, but it slows down proportional to the size of its inputs. It's not slowing down faster than the size of inputs. It's not slowing down slower than the size of its inputs. And then right here, kind of in the middle, we have two other complexity classes. We have n log n, so this is the size of the problem times the logarithm of the size of the problem. This is actually an important complexity class when we come back and talk about sorting. But you can see, again, this is growing, like, pretty gently, particularly when compared uh, with this, which is n squared. So this is um, an exponential, some exponential. It could be n squared, it could be n cubed, whatever. Size of the problem squared. So this is growing quickly, this is growing much more slowly. And so in a minute, we'll talk about, you know, different algorithms for solving different problems, and we'll be doing that a lot for the rest of the semester, but you can imagine how much of a change it can make to move something from that O n squared line down to O n log n. So we're gonna see sorting algorithms that are O n squared, and then we're gonna see better sorting algorithms that are O n log n. So, you know, let's say you have a problem of size 30, you've now reduced the amount of time it takes by almost a factor of 10. As the problem gets bigger and bigger, those improvements are even, are even greater, right? A factor of 10 may not seem like a lot, but imagine if that's the difference between an algorithm that you wrote running for 10 days and one day, or 10 hours and one hour or 10 minutes and one minute. Like, that's an amount of time that you're gonna start to notice. Yeah, question? Wait, so the log n is just the same as the log n of This is log n, right? Right along x, yeah. Yeah, it is very good, right? Again, in a lot of cases, we can't achieve log n, because log n doesn't even count. So for example, if I have to sort an array, I have to look at every value. Once I've looked at every value, I have O n. So if I, if you can invent a log, an O log N sorting algorithm, you will win some kind of prize. But you will also exist in some other universe, right, where you can sort things without seeing them, right? Again, if you can do that, go for it, yeah. Is there such thing as O N to the N? Never. Uh, probably. It's not on this graph. Right? That would be also bad, yeah. So the question was, is there a O N to the nth power complexity class. I haven't seen a problem that falls into it, but probably. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, like, a break or something in the data for O n, and then it'll be, like, O n max? Yeah, it very much depends. We'll, we'll, we'll look at some cases about this in a minute, right? So the question was, if there's a break inside my loop, what complexity class do I fall in? That's where we start talking about things like, what are my inputs typically look like, right? Because if the break is never hit, right, then I might still have to execute the entire loop, right? If the break is hit really early, then I might almost have something that's constant time, right? We'll, we will see an example of this in, like, three slides. Yeah, in the back. Uh, 
I don't doubt it. All I, all I, all I can claim is that it is impossible to sort a list in under O N. Yeah. I hope so. Maybe there's a quantum list sorting algorithm that can run faster. I doubt it. Okay. So let's break these down a little bit. Let's start looking at some examples. Because one of the things that we're gonna need to start learning how to do is identifying pieces of algorithms that produce certain behaviors. So O1, constant time. What's a constant time operation? Most of the lines of code that you see are constant time operations. It's not always, but most of them. Um, dereferencing a value from an array is a constant time operation. That's actually kind of interesting. Um, why is that? So it turns out that the way that arrays are stored in memory is that all of the items are right next to each other. And so if I know where the start of the array is, and I know what element you want, Java can compute exactly where that element is in memory. And so it's sort of like this front row of seats here, right? I know exactly how many there are, and I know exactly how far apart they are, and I'm not gonna do this because I would probably, like, walk into my stand or something like that, but if I was clever, I could essentially kind of, you know, walk this direction without thinking about it for a certain amount of time and then stop, and I would know where I was, right? Everyone, all the people that are in this array are right next to each other, and so I can compute exactly where the element is and access it in constant time, all right? So array accesses both sets and gets constant time operation in Java, okay? O-N, right? So O-N, still not too bad. Um, you know, we, we like algorithms if we can get O-N performance. And again, a lot of times O-N is a lower bound. So for example, think about summing the elements of an array. Here's a small bit of code that does that. I have to access every element of the array. Again, if you can write an algorithm that sums an array without accessing every element, I will be very impressed. I have to read every element from the array and add it to the sum. And so the best I can do here is ON, and it turns out that there's a very straightforward ON algorithm. There it is. I just loop through the array, I pull every value out one by one, and I add them to my sum. So the step inside the loop is constant time, addition is a constant time operation, and I have to, but I have to access every element of the array. So doing this type of loop sum is O n, where n is the size of the array. So what's the feature of the problem? The number of elements in the array. How does it grow with the size of the feature? It grows linear, right? The more elements, the longer it takes to sum them all. Okay. Again, sometimes this is the best we can do. Okay. So to somebody's question about break. So here's a different example, similar to the homework that you did yesterday, except I'm using primitive types instead of objects in Java. What is this doing, this piece of code? It's looking for a value. It's got an array, and I've passed in some int called looking for, and essentially what I'm doing is I'm comparing it against every element in the array, and if I found it, I'm gonna stop, and maybe I return true there or something like that, and if I don't, I keep looking. So now I don't have, I have some conditional logic inside my loop, and now I have to think a little bit about the different cases. So what's the best case runtime for this algorithm? Best case. Yeah, let's say that the value that I'm looking for is the first one in the array. Then this loop stops immediately. So the best case, constant time. I only perform one operation. What about the worst case? It's the last element, or it doesn't exist in the array at all. At which point I have to look through every element of the array. What's the runtime for that? O-N. If I don't tell you anything about what the value is I'm looking for, or anything about the values in the array, what would be the average case runtime? This is tough, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's where this gets tricky. So the question is, do I have to consider the two cases of whether it's in the array or not? Let's say, let me, let me simplify it a little bit. Let's say that the value that I pass in to look for is always in the array somewhere. Then what's the average case runtime? N over two. Sometimes I find it at the beginning, sometimes I find it at the end. In general, I look for about half the elements before I find. If I don't know whether the element is actually in the array, then this becomes much more complicated, because then the question becomes, how often do I find it? Because every time I go through the array and don't find it, it's O N. So for example, if I told you that the value is never in, in the array, what's the average case runtime? O N, because I always go through all the values looking for this thing that I'm looking for and I never find it. So in that case, I'm O N. So again, average cases can be tricky. Sometimes they require us to make assumptions about the problem. All right. Best case, first element, worst case, last element. Average case, if it's in the array, is O n over two. And we would simplify that to just be O n. So again, we're not concerned about these constant factors. Because at the limit, they tend to kind of go away. We're interested in how does the problem grow with the inputs. This one grows linearly. The larger the array, the longer it takes. Okay, let's look at a different problem. O n squared. So one way to identify, particularly when, you know, again, one of the things I'm, we're gonna start training you to do is to see features of these algorithms that indicate or suggest a particular type of complexity class behavior. So if I see a loop over an array, I probably have O n. You have to look at what's inside of it. Maybe the first thing it does is break immediately, at which point it's O1, but that's a stupid loop. A normal, I'm serious, like, don't write that loop. A normal loop does work over the array, and so, you know, even if it's breaking that, then I start to think, okay, how often does it break, where is it gonna break, whatever. Um, but a lot of times when I see a loop, I start thinking O N. If I see two loops, nested loops, if I see two loops one after another, that could still be O N. Because I've got O N on top, I've got O N on bottom. Overall, I've got O 2 N. I ignore the constant factor. It's still growing linearly with the size of the input. Nested loops, I start to worry. Because this starts to look like O N squared. So for every time the outer loop runs, which goes through the entire array, the inner loop also runs. And it goes through most of the array. You'll see that this inner loop actually starts at I, so it's only going through the second half. Sorry, not the second half. It goes through all the remaining values. What does this do? Anybody tell me? This is a particularly terrible implementation of a, of a, of something, right? This is a, an algorithm you can describe in a sentence. What does this accomplish? Other than running really slowly. Yeah. Yeah, so this checks whether or not the array is sorted in ascending order. So it goes through, and it's actually checking a bunch of pairs of elements more than once, which is really dumb, right? And essentially it goes through all the, it starts at all the outer elements, then it goes through all the inner elements, starting at that element, it looks for a case where one of them's out of order. If that's true, it returns false. If it checks the entire array this way and doesn't find anything, it returns and again, this is an intentionally bad piece of code. I just want to warn you, um, this is not the way to do this. If you get a job interview and someone asks you, write code, check if an array is sorted, and you write this code, you will not get the job. Unless it's, and if you do get the job, don't work there. Because um, they have stupid interviewers. Okay, so, if, in cases where I have to do this kind of double looping, I'm usually starting to worry that I have an O-N squared situation. Again, I have a break in there, right? Uh, sorry, I have a return statement, right? Um, not a break. But I also, I'm not starting at the beginning every time. And so technically, the first time I do n times n, the second time um, I do, sorry, the first time I do n, the second time I do n minus one, the third time I do n minus two. Um, and so the average is actually n times n over two, so it's n squared over two, but we're gonna round that to n squared. Was that what the question here was about? Jeremy. Wait. Okay. 
Right, and this, the, the way you can identify these or the thing that you should look at, if someone gives you one of these and says, you know, how long is this gonna take to run, describe it using big O notation when you see nested loops. That's your clue. You might have an O-N squared situation going on. All right, um, best case for this algorithm, though. So let's think about best case, worst case behavior. So this has a return inside of it. So that return statement can actually cause the entire algorithm to terminate. What is the best case scenario for this algorithm? Yeah. Yeah, so the first pair of elements in the array that it checks are out of order. So if the array starts with, if the index zero is um, greater than index one, it'll fail immediately. So the best case is constant time. The unsorted element is right at the very beginning, I'm done. Worst case. Yeah. Yeah, and this is one of these places where, you know, when you start thinking about how algorithms work, you might think about how this is being used in your code. Let's say that you have a situation where you're pretty sure that an array is sorted and you wanna test it. So most of the time, is sorted returns true? Most of the time, you're taking an n squared hit. That's not good. If it was the opposite, and you were pretty sure the array wasn't sorted, and you just wanted to test it before you sorted it, then it might be okay, because when the array is not sorted, the algorithm terminates much more quickly. So again, we have to think about how this is being used. Okay? Average case, O n squared. Again, the average case is, you know, the unsorted element is somewhere in the middle so the outer loop has run n times, and every time I run the outer loop, I'm running the inner loop roughly n times. Um, and so the, the average case behavior is actually probably like n squared over four, but we'll call it n squared. We're gonna ignore those constant factors. All right. So we're here with this algorithm. We're on this, this green line, and like I said, that's not a particularly good looking place to be. These, so I'm, I'm trying to sort of do a survey of these complexity classes. The O n log n and O log n. So O log n is caused by a feature of algorithm design that we haven't really seen yet, but we will talk about this soon. But you might think about this. If my algorithm can make the problem half as small each time, then what I end up with is O log n. So if there's some step in my algorithm that I repeat that takes the original problem at size n and then makes it n over two, n over four, n over eight, the number of steps I'm gonna have to run before I find an answer is log n. And then you combine that with other parts of an algorithm that add, sometimes add an n factor. So the sorting, the best case sorting algorithm we're gonna see that operates on arbitrary data is O n log n. And it has a log n step, and I have to repeat that n times. Okay, and sorry, I can't miss a chance to talk about recursion, so the recursive algorithms we'll start talking about next week when we start talking about trees frequently have this problem, because they typically make the problem, or they try to make the problem, smaller at every step. And if I write them correctly and if I have a good data structure, I can frequently make the problem about half the size each time. Okay, oops, going in the wrong direction. So the differences between algorithms can be incredibly important, and this is particularly true when we're talking about working with large data. Small data, whatever. You know, do something simple. You saw, actually, let me just back up quickly. You saw down here at the bottom, it's like everything's kind of okay if I have really small problems. But once the problem starts to grow, the differences between these algorithm starts to become an enormous problem, right? And so a dumb algorithm can essentially take a problem that really belongs in a particular complexity class and make it slower. So for example, the, the algorithm that we wrote to test if an array is sorted is really dumb. I warned you about this, it's a bad algorithm. Checking whether an array is sorted is O n. The algorithm we wrote is O n squared. So that's why you're not gonna get a job if you write that one. 
right? You just made all of the company's code that much slower. Um, in contrast, a smart algorithm can do the opposite. So if I take a problem and I apply an elegant and clever algorithm, then I can actually make the problem a little better. So Euclid's algorithm, sorry, GCD algorithm was dumb, it was O-N. Euclid's method is smarter, it's O log N. So it's taken the, this problem that was growing linear, and it's now moved it down to a complexity class where it grows much more slow. When we start talking about data structures, we're also gonna see this trade-off. It's really interesting because we'll see the implementation of it, and so you'll see exactly the code that's running and why this happens. But different data structures also have these trade-offs when we talk about different operations on them. And so we're gonna start in a few minutes looking at lists and different implementations of lists, and lists have this property where one implementation of a list, it's very slow to insert, but it's very fast to do lookups. Another implementation of a list can be very slow to do lookups, but certain insertions can be very fast. So I'm making a trade-off here. If you are trying to write a computer program and you need a list, this is a place where you have a design decision to make. Because depending on how your program uses the list, choosing one implementation over the other can have a big performance impact even though they're identical, they present the identical interface, the implementation is different and that can cause trade-offs. All right. So let me briefly talk about one of the deep, fun, unsolved problems in computer science. So if there's anything, you know, algorithms are the conceptual core of computer science as a field. If there's anything that computer science has gifted to the world, it's a rigorous consideration of how hard different things are to do. And, you know, we, we, we implement these algorithms because we have these computers to run them, but there is still this loftier, completely theoretical consideration of how hard is a problem. How many people have heard about this before? Okay, good, a couple of you. So there is, this is by far the deepest unsolved problem in computer science. There's like a million dollar reward out there for anybody who can solve this problem. And the problem is actually pretty simple to explain. The question is, is there a certain category of problems that are just fundamentally harder than every other problem in the world? Right now, we have a category of such problems that are in what they call NP. They cannot be solved in polynomial time. There's not a polynomial time algorithm to solve them. And there's also really beautiful relationships between these problems, but there's a certain number of problems. I'm gonna show you one of them in a minute. It's kind of a fun one. And so the question that we're trying to answer as a field is no one has been able to prove this, although as time goes on, we start to feel more confident that maybe this is actually true. But the question is, are those problems really fundamentally harder than other problems, or have we just not come up with the right algorithm to solve them yet? One of the things that characterizes problems in NP is that it's easy to verify a solution. So a solution, if I give you a solution, you can verify that it's correct in polynomial time. But if I give you the problem, you can't solve it in polynomial time. What do I mean by polynomial time? N squared, N cubed, N to the fourth. Anything that's the size of the problem to an exponent. Non-polynomial time, stuff like the factorial class, two to the N, right? N to the N, things that grow faster than polynomial time. So I don't play Sudoku, but Sudoku is actually an example of a problem where the general case of Sudoku. So if I have an n squared by n squared board consisting of n by n uh, sub problems, so essentially if I do four squares with four in them, five squares on each side, each cell has five in them, that problem is in NP. 
We do not have a polynomial time algorithm that we know of to solve this problem. Now, again, I told you that you can verify solutions in polynomial time, and with Sudoku, that's true. So if I give you a—if if I come to you and say, I've solved the Sudoku problem, you can write a polynomial time algorithm to check that my solution is correct. But no one has a polynomial time, polynomial time algorithm for solving this problem. We've made some progress on this in your lifetime. I don't know if you guys heard about this. I can't remember exactly when this was, but several years ago, someone came up with a polynomial time algorithm for prime factorization. That was one of the problems that up until that point, we thought there was no polynomial time algorithm to solve. Someone developed a polynomial time algorithm to do it. Now, I want to warn you about something, which is that and this is, an, it, this is interesting, this is sort of where theory meets practice. The polynomial time algorithm is not necessarily faster. In many cases, it's slower than our best, um, you know, non-polynomial algorithms, because we have some clever tricks that we can play on certain problems, particularly using randomization. So there are randomized algorithms for determining if a, num determining if a number is prime that are much faster than the polynomial time algorithm that somebody developed. But it's still an important moment because we've taken a problem that we thought was in NP, and we've moved it into the class of problems P that are solvable in polynomial time. I am curious, given your age, whether or not you will see this problem solved in your lifetime. If you do, you will read about it in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, it'll be on CNN and whatever news outlets you, you tend to follow. This will be huge news, because this is, you know, again, this deep, unsolved problem about just how hard things are. Are there certain problems, and you can go look these up, that are just fundamentally more difficult? Has the universe put them into some special category where there is no polynomial time algorithm that will ever be able to solve those problems? Can we prove that? If somebody can do it, like I said, you'll hear about it. Okay. So I think at this point I'm gonna stop and come back to this on Friday. What we're going to do on Friday is we're going to start talking about some operations on arrays and talking about um, different ways to generalize arrays to, into, into a more general data structure that we'll work with on Friday and then on Monday. Okay? But I think this is a good, good place to pause. I've got, oh, you know what? Hold on. I've got one minute, and so I'm going to do this dumb thing that I don't want to talk about next time. Okay, ready? 30 seconds. This is super boring. So in Java, there are certain data structures that only operate on objects. Primitive types in Java are not objects. So what do we do? For every primitive type in Java, there's something that's called a wrapper type that's an object. So here they are. For int, you have something called integer. For long, you have something called long. For boolean, you have something called boolean. For character, you have something called character. For double, you have something called double. For byte, you have something called byte. Essentially, these are usually the name of the primitive type capitalized, except there's a couple of stupid exceptions, okay? I am done talking about this. We are going to use these next time. They are not that complicated to understand. They are objects, though they are not primitive types. They wrap primitive types. In many ways, they behave like them, but they also provide object methods like equals and hash count. All right, awesome. I have office hours starting now. I will see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>